Thanks everyone for your patience this morning. So we'll start immediately. Again, I want to say welcome on behalf of the management and staff of Expo TT and happy Valentine's Day to everyone. We were wondering if people would come out because it was Valentine's Day, but we enjoy your company here today. Our facilitator this morning is Mr. Richard Aching, the manager technical examination in the intellectual property office of Trinidad and Tobago. Some of the duties he would perform there include substantive examination on patents, utility certificates, industrial designs, new plant varieties and integrated circuits, and he advises the controller on all technical issues relating to the grant of intellectual property rights. Richard has been with the Intellectual Property Office since 1999. I want to invite everyone this morning to please take advantage of this opportunity to ask him any and every question you may have on intellectual property considerations for services companies. We have specially designed this program for you and a series of others which you will be advised of in the future. So I'd like to hand over to Richard now. Thanks again. Good. Good morning, all, and thanks again for your uh, immense patience. I forgot today is also um, SEA mock exams for many people. So congratulations and good luck to. You know, once you have children doing SEA, you doing it too. It's adult education, huh? and happy Valentine's as well. Uh, just curious to know um, where we're starting off at. Um, how many of us here have ever heard of intellectual property before? That's good. How many of us think it's relevant to your business? That's even better yet. How many of us are actually using it in your business? Uh, total. All right. I know, that, I know there would be some gaps. And we're going to set some, some ground, some hopefully present to you the, the breadth of IP. And uh, I don't know your particular businesses. I just know it's services. But you may see something in there that's applicable to where you are right now or where you plan to be. So um, this is simply what I'm going to do. Uh, what is IP, what the office does briefly, and hopefully um, benefits. Why should we pursue it? OK. OK, what is it? Let's start with the fundamentals. We often say intellectual property concerns the expressed creations of the human intellect. We all, always get these, this comment from the public. Um, I would like to protect my idea, or I have an idea, or I have a concept. What can I do about it? And we very bluntly tell them, uh, your ideas are useless if they stay in your head. They've got to come out of your head. They've got to be expressed. You've got to uh, write the business plan, build the sculpture, sing the song, invent the invention, or actually create it. You've got to actually produce it. So it's got to be uh, made in a tangible form somehow. Expressed. That's what we mean by expressed. So this is, this is fundamental uh, to getting any sort of IP protected. Uh, so as soon as you conceptualize something, is, is actually the time when you should be looking to see, is it some sort of IP? And, and the idea is you do that before you engage other entities or other partners. I'll explain what that means later. So this is a little bit on, on the office where we get involved. Our primary function is to grant intellectual property rights. We receive applications for industrial property rights. We examine them. We might grant them. I have at least, uh, at least two colleagues from the trademark examination section. So if you have any trademarks before us, you could pester them as well. Uh, but we, we also do opposition hearings and filing of international applications from foreign applicants and for local applicants who are seeking to for, file abroad. So that's where we get involved, at that nexus. And of course, we get involved in the development of the entire legislative system, the international treaties that advise our national legislation. So that's, that's, that's where we are. Uh, I, I don't know if it was clear in the logo there, but we are part, presently inside of the Ministry of Legal Affairs. I want to emphasize, though, 
uh, intellectual property is not solely a legal issue. It's actually a combination of law, business, science. All the things that you need to get your business going, that's where we are. So it's not just a, a bunch of lawyers. I am not a lawyer. That's not a, a mark of pride. My colleagues always say I'm very proud of that. <laughs> right, so we, we tend to <coughs> split IP into two main branches. I think most of us, especially at carnival time, are familiar with copyright and related rights because this is the time of the year when we hear about music piracy. And I trust you guys are not engaged in it. And you're not buying your burnt CDs on the road with compilations and you're buying your originals, right? Very good. And the other side is in industrial property. And the main difference is with copyright and related rights, they are what we call automatic rights. So they arise automatically as soon as the author or the creator or the singer, composer, creates his literary or artistic work. That's because we are signatory to something called the Berne Convention. So all the other signatories have agreed that we will impose no fees or forms or administrative procedures to get copyright. So you don't have to come down by the office to fill out anything to get copyright. You have it. You create an original work. Let's say you put together a business plan or you're probably bored already and sketched a poem or doodle. You own it already. And you've seen that symbol, the C in a circle, the name of the author, the year in which it was created. You don't have to get permission from anyone to put that in. Once you're sure that that work is yours, you put it on. That's automatic. So your rights arise automatically in Russia, Japan, wherever, at the same time. Your challenge will be, though, to prove that you, say, that you did what you say you did when you did it. That's another legal issue, uh, which you can get into with affidavits, uh, sworn statements. Uh, you might have heard of the, the poor man's copyright, yeah. mailing stuff back to yourself via registered mail, and keeping it sealed. Some people may have heard of that. So that's automatic. The other big branch is industrial property, which are what we call territorial rights or sovereign rights. So they're granted by states. That means if you want rights also right next door in Grenada or Venezuela, you have to actually go and file over there. Each country, what you are interested in doing business in or you want to have your rights exercised in. That's, that's an important consideration when you're planning your your business or your expansion activities or how far are you going to offer your services? You need to consider where am I going next? This has implications for your branding and I'll get into it later. So, so corporate and related rights relate to literary and artistic works. Uh, some of us are familiar with some of these things, some, of the, some famous paintings, movies, whether it's old movies or new movies, so literary and artistic works, uh, games. I bet half of us here have Angry Birds on our phones, at least. Or Flappy Bird, the late Flappy Bird. Uh, this, this gives a, a, a view of the, the, the universe of IP. Um, I've, I've left the, the presentation on the laptop, and I suppose the organizers can make it available to you via, via Dropbox, because it's a kind of a big file. So audiovisual works, paintings, architectural drawings, uh, anything on paper. Uh, also, in, under our legislation, we protect software under copyright. And you notice in the middle there, um, works of mass, very significant. We protect those as collective works specifically. I think we are one of the only two countries that protect expressly works of mass. And presently, there's some negotiations going on at the Intergovernmental Committee dealing with traditional knowledge and folklore, where we are trying to get works of mass in the definitions there so that other countries will be obliged to protect all works of mass when they go out there. But that, that's in the works still. So you get the idea. Literary, artistic. There's another um, side to intellectual property rights you need to be aware of. That is exceptions and limitations. These are not absolute rights. They're not for all things considered. There is a short list of exclusions. You know, it's a very short list of what is not protectable. Certainly ideas, procedures, discoveries, of obviously things that you didn't invent or create yourself, but you've, you, just, you stumbled upon or you discovered, but you won't be able to own those. Uh, made, this is raw data, not organized data, not a database. Databases are protectable, but not raw data. 
uh, legislation, where the government has taken a decision to make its laws freely available to all and copyable by all, so we won't impose. I think they only sell the originals. If you buy them from the state, then you, then, then you pay for them. But other than that, they are freely available on the website of the Ministry of Legal Affairs, legalaffairs.gov.tt. Uh, political speeches. <laughs> That's interesting. So all of that talk, not protected by copyright. And there's another half of it, related rights. So consider this. Most of these um, artists, and I make a distinction between an artist and an artiste. And sometimes we say the artist is the one who just sings it, and the artist is the one who creates it. So many of them have composers somewhere in the background, or they bought a song from someone. And you probably know the, the games. People write songs for people. And somebody else performs it. So what we're saying is that the the, the composer has copyright, he owns copyright, but the performer has performance rights. So when they sing it, every time they perform it, that performance belongs to them, the, com the, the performer. And, and then there's some downstream activities. Let's say the broadcaster. Uh, I don't know how many of you follow football, cricket, IPL, but a lot of the money that generates out of those activities is not just from ticket sales at the venue, you know. Most of that money comes from licensing the media rights to broadcasters. So once you own a venue, you own a concert, that's your concert, that's your venue, you own all the media or the, the, the intellectual creations that come out of it, the performances, the permission to broadcast that, you can sell those things. And these guys sell them, the Olympics. Very aggressive. You can't put anything with their symbols on it or, hint, or post one peep of it on YouTube before they, they'll take it down. They're very aggressive with it they like, because they license it, the daylight out of it. And that's what propels them. That's what makes the money. When, when countries opt to host the Olympics and go, go through all that expenditure, you notice Brazil is, is up to the neck in like 2.5 billion and, and rising, preparing for the next Olympics. How are they planning to recoup that cost? They're going to license <laughs> media rights. Not just ticket sales. Ticket sales will never pay for that. <laughs> So just be aware of that. That's, that's the other side of um, related rights. And under our law, now re those rights I just mentioned, they relate really primarily to the economic rights. That's your right to exploit something economically. And under our law, I'm saying our law because not every country has the same structure. For example, the US does not have moral rights. Not that they're immoral, huh? it has nothing to do with morality. But the moral rights are simply there to, for the artist or the creator to be named as the composer or the artist. Your right to, to have your name on your work. Simple as that. That's, that's the base level. And the next is the right to simply object to distortions of your work or misuse or what you consider to be misuse of your work. So if you created um, a song and you discover a certain political party is using it in their campaign, and you, you don't want to be associated with them, you can object to say, listen, pull that song. I don't want you all to use this. Or, for example, like, it has happened before uh, a sound, as a soundtrack for a pornography film, so you don't want your music associated with that. You can object to that. Artists or artists have ob objected to people um, breaking up their paintings or splitting it into, into pieces. Uh, I think something happened similarly with the the Queen's Hall, where the original architect insisted that you put it back in its original shape and not, not, not change the shape. It's, that, that's, that's the fundamentals of, of moral rights. Uh, those rights can be, um, can be waived, but more importantly, they are retained even after the, the, the rights have been um, transferred. So let's say you, you create a cartoon character you sell it to Marvel, congratulations. Uh, you can insist that um, the ca character remain true to form as you created it. Most likely Marvel asks you to, tra to transfer those rights to them because they don't want you tampering with the work later on. Uh, but that's, that's the reality of it. So even after you sell the rights, and I want us to get, get in our heads the picture of, of intellectual property rights in the same way we are very comfortable with real property rights and physical rights. So we're very, very comfortable with property, land, 
your car, your watch. Think of IP in the same way. You can give it away, you can lend it to somebody, you can sell it outright, or you can license it for under specific conditions. Right, this, the big branch of industrial property. <clears throat> so this gets into some less familiar ground. Patents for inventions, trademarks for brands and logos. May not have heard of industrial designs. You think you know what our new plant varieties. Bet you never heard of that one. Geographical indications. Integrated circuits might have a, an idea. And you think you know tree, tree circuits. All right, let's start with patents for inventions. Uh, these are for products and processes and, and devices and gadgets and chemicals. And uh, in some countries, like the US, they will protect some kinds of software under patents. Uh, if you've, um, I don't know if you're following the, the cell phone wars, right, a lot of that revolves around so Apple versus everybody else on software patents. And some of them are tech actually technology patents. Right, so that's what, what, what patents are a solution to a problem. It may not always be applicable to all service industries, but just bear in mind this is one of the options available. So they're there for inventions, technical solutions to existing problems, in short. And some of us know historically some, some old inventions, the, the Wright Brothers flyer. Anybody know what that is? Very good. Who said that? Anyway. <laughs> it's Viagra. That's good that most of you don't know what that is. The little blue pill, the, the, the chemical ingredient in Viagra is protected by a patent, which was originally granted for a drug to treat a heart condition called angina. And then the doctors noticed a useful side effect. <laughs> and then they reapplied for a, a second medical use for um, Vi Viagra or sildenafil citrate, which is the chemical name. And that's Gatorade. You may be wondering, Gatorade, what does Gatorade have to do with patents? It's a sports drink. Well, it started off as, as an experiment in the University of Florida. Back in those days, the conventional wisdom for athletes was, if you're running on the field playing football or whatever, you should not drink water mid-game. You should just run, 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 run until you're exhausted and the coach has to sub you out. That was the conventional wisdom at the time. And Dr. Robert Cade, figured out quite rightly that the reason why the boys are collapsing is because they are dehydrated and they have lost electrolytes. Why, why your sweat is salty? Because you're losing salt, and you need, but your body needs salt for your, just for your nerves to function. So he reasoned that if I restore the fluids and the electrolytes and add some glucose or sugar, I can restore some performance to the, the athletes. And so that's what he tried. And he, he created a specific recipe of salts, electrolytes, glucose, and um, the team started to conquer. They were just killing everybody in sight. And of course, the other teams were envious, and that, what you're feeding those boys is not natural, you know? And then his wife, and oh, by the way, the name of the team was the Florida Gators, right? And the story is that his wife suggested that perhaps you can improve the palatability of the, that concoction because it contained um, potassium chloride, most of us are familiar with sodium chloride, good old table salt, but potassium chloride, closely related, but it tastes awful. So obviously the, the guys drank it, but under protest. So she suggested, let's add some lemonade to the, the concoction to make it taste a little better, and that's how they hatched the name Gator Aid. That's the story, All right? Anyway, cut the long story short, they eventually licensed it out to present manufacturers, and the Univers University of Florida retains the rights and gets all the royalties now. Hundreds of millions of dollars so far in just licensing. So they, they never had to produce a single, well, since they licensed, they didn't have to produce a single gallon. They just licensed. That's what I'm talking about. That the property was the right to manufacture, which they gave to somebody else uh, in return for payment. See? Right, um, just to get into, oh, there's our friend again. Yeah. There's some criteria for getting a, a, a patent. And, and like most intellectual property, the, the first criterion is novelty. 
what you're discovering a lot of IP, IP does not, is not too concerned with old stuff, it's concerned with new things. And so that, that's a major criteria. Uh, criteria, sorry. Novelty, it's got to be brand new in the whole wide world, uh, no less than one year before fi your filing date. This has implications for people who are publishers, who publish scientific works, people who enter invention competitions, like the I2I and the Newhouse competitions, Prime Minister's Awards, because chances are if you are successful in those uh, arenas, your works may be publish publicly disclosed, so the world can see it, which puts you at risk, actually, from competitors. I, do, I hope you appreciate that. But what it does is allows the... Under, under TT law and under US law, we allow a one-year grace period. So you can show off the works today, and we give you one year to file a patent application. Okay? The European Union uh, previously did not have any grace period. So as far as you're concerned, if you show off your invention today, you cannot file a, a patent tomorrow. And I can tell you many, many um, uh, clients have been locked out of the European market because, of, because they, they prematurely exposed their the invention. I think the, Europe now has a six-month grace period. It's kind of almost grudging. So we're not given a whole year, just six months. Um, so that's, that's very significant. So keep that in mind that if, if you're going forward with anything like that, you need to consider at what point do I disclose or do I share the invention? Because you have to be aware of timelines and the clock will start ticking from the time you show off this thing to the public. Okay? The next thing is inventive step. Uh, or otherwise known as non-obviousness. It must be non, the invention must be non-obvious to a person who has average skill in that area of technology. Uh, by way of illustration, most of us are here sitting on, on four-legged chairs. And I think the, the norm in the world is chairs have four legs, so that's the prior art, that's the standard, four-legged chairs. If you invent a chair with five legs, well, you might be considered novel, you're new, but to a person who makes chairs, that is not new. That is, or it's new, but it's not inventive. That's, what we mean. That's a simple uh, explanation of inventive step. It's not inventive enough. It's obvious to a chair maker. So in order to get a patent, your, your, your new invention on a chair must be non-obvious to a chair maker, for example. So if your, if your fifth leg does something that chair legs don't normally do, like play a tune or, re or sing out your weight, Chair legs don't normally do that. So they'll consider, okay, that's, that's inventive. It might not sell a lot, but it's inventive. Uh, that's, a, that's another consideration you have to have in the back of your head. Being clever is not enough, because your, your, your goal is to make money. So if you can't sell being bright, you, you fail essentially. Industrial applicability. It's got to have an application in industry, or it's got to be workable. It's got to have a technical effect. In short, it's got to work. I'm saying this because we do get applications for things that don't work, flying saucer technology, we sometimes call it perpetual motion machines, things that uh, are contrary to the laws of physics, chemistry, everything. Okay? It doesn't stop people from filing it, but they just won't get granted. So just bear that in mind. Your technology has to work. Uh, the examiners who work at the, in the patent section are, are scientists, so we know how things are supposed to work. And sometimes we interview or have a meeting with an inventor, and we try to explain to him why his invention, as described, can't work. He insists it will work because he has it on paper. He has, so we simply tell him, why don't you go and build one and bring it back, and then we'll, we'll chat again, and then we don't see them again, because know, we know that if they try to build one, it won't work, or they'll hurt themselves. Uh, you might be wondering what we put there. Anybody recognize this? It's an artificial heart. It's one of the newer, newer versions. If you've been following the Javik series uh, of artificial hearts, it's not perfected yet, but we're getting there. Uh, the automobile industry employs a lot of patented technology in the cars themselves, in the technologies in the cars, how the wipers work. There's an old story of Ford versus an, an, an inventor who invented the first intermittent windshield wiper. Flash of Genius, I think it was made into, into a movie. Uh, and uh, it outlines that guy's very tenacious battle with Ford for them to pay him for his invention because they just took it from him. 
uh, and also in the, the technology extends to the, the factories themselves. So I know Audi uh, boasts, or they used to boast in one of the ad campaigns that they have more patents than NASA. That means that uh, it, that's for the whole of Audi, yeah? not, <laughs> not for one car. Right. Industrial designs, uh, less familiar area. Industrial designs deal with manufactured items to, or, or items of craft or hand, handicraft and concerns only the shape, just the shape or patterns, combination of lines and drawings. So it's, it's extensively used, for example, in the fashion industry by fashion designers for the clothing, for jewelry. We receive industrial designs for jewelry. Uh, if you go shopping for perfume, I bet you will be hard pressed to find any two perfumes, two different brands of perfume in the same shape of bottle because they want to distinguish themselves from the competition. So you, you have some contorted shape or, or the other. Uh, I think it's used also extensively in the toothbrush industry, for example. Just to give you an example. I don't know how many of you shop at Pennywise, but if you see the entire array of brands and shapes and sizes of toothbrushes, because most of us just say, I just want soft bristles. They don't care what it looks like. Some people care <laughs> whether it's cross bristles, um, tongue scrubbers, gum massagers, whatever. It changes the shape of the, the, the toothbrush and the handle shape. Those shapes are protected by industrial design. Colgate Palmolive is extremely aggressive in this market. Um, Gillette is also another aggressive um, applicant regarding the shapes of their shaver handles. Uh, the Mark III's and the Venus series, you name it. Uh, one of the better known ones that ran a long time in Trinidad is the chubby bottle shape. I don't know if you know the history, but uh, you may have noticed that nobody else makes a bottle in that shape except SM Jalil, only for chubby. Solo tried to compete with a, something called a little boy. Anybody remember that? Or small boy? No, nah, it's little boy. It's little boy, I think. Little boy. It didn't do as well, fell off the market. Something to bear in mind. When you do these things, you do it to enhance your competitiveness. So if you catch on to a design that has the appeal of the market, you, you would want to protect it to keep the competition off your back for as long as possible. Um, industrial designs last for five years, but they can be renewed twice. So they, they let it run for a full 15 years before it expired. It has expired, don't tell anybody that, because technically, Technically, anybody can manufacture that shape now. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Watches, jewelry, ah, the famous iPhone. That who, the, the start of the fight with, between uh, Apple and Samsung was over an industrial design. Just to let you know, you might, if you read the US press, you'll see, well, it was a pattern infringement. In the US, they call industrial designs design patterns. In our parlance, it would be an industrial design. So what they did was infringe Apple's protection of the shape and the, uh, the look of the iPhone. With the, um, you know, Apple, their standard now is uh, round with a square inside. And you know Samsung's, I'm a Samsung person, now has a rectangular uh, button at the bottom just to avoid confusion because they were complaining to the judge. So you mean to tell me that Apple owns rectangles with rounded corners? Well, in that case, my fridge is infringing. <laughs> I mean, there was some, if you had seen the, the, um, the court battles, it was kind of hilarious to, to read out. And they went to task with the judge on that one. But they prevailed, and I think it was a $1 billion judgment, even though they didn't pay all of that. Some big money at stake here, folks. Uh, in the area of, of clothing, uh, we have a, a local lady who designs hijabs with particular appliques, and so they don't operate like standard hijabs, I don't know if you have any hijabi here, no? If you know how to put on one. They're not simple scarves that you, you tie on the chin. These are they're really elaborate. You know? And so she sells to a particular market that wants a, a, a hijab that's appropriate, let's say for a wedding or a special occasion. Shoe manufacturers, the Nikes and the Pumas, all of them have particular shapes protected for their sole, the pattern, the tread pattern. And also the technology that's inside it. The technology inside, it, in, inside the shoe is protected by patent, but the shape of the shoe is protected by industrial design. I don't know if any of you all live in Shogonas and have seen this ice cream parlor. 
That's protected. That's a building. It, it started off selling ice cream, so, and it was shaped just like that, like a giant ice cream cone. I think location was the problem. It was a kind of a dangerous corner, so it's not kid-friendly then, <laughs> or client-friendly. I think they sell chicken and chips now, I'm told. <laughs> but the, but the, the, the idea is, that was his, if he, so he, if he had a better location, he might have done better with his, but it was a great idea, we thought. And it was pretty unique in that. Uh, and I, like I said, two brushes, very aggressive. Right, less familiar area, integrated circuits. Or oh, the full name is uh, layout designs and topographies of integrated circuits. Any arrangement of electrical components on a semiconductor or circuit board. And I hope you appreciate, you probably, you probably do appreciate the advances in, in making these circuits smaller and smaller and more compact because now we can fit whole computers in our pockets. Uh, if you know the history of computing, you remember the first computers you see the size this room and, and not, as, not even as powerful as your watch in computing pro, pro, power. And so we have these things miniaturized now and we're very familiar with them. Computer chips, circuit boards, cameras with phones in them, phones with cameras in them, uh, touch watches, even your, even your appliances, your stoves, your washing machines, you name it, has circuit boards in them. Uh, we just appreciate how when they work fine and we, we complain when they don't. But they, it's made possible by advances in how uh, components are assembled together, and that those those circuit designs are protectable by something called integrated circuits. New plant varieties are not any bush you discover in a forest, but something that you have bred, that you put, that you have intervened in in cross breeding. So some of us may remember when anthuriums used to come in one color, red, may, then maybe two colors, red or white, and then somebody decided to cross them, and you get pink. And then they started doing more and more crosses to get greens and all these shades with them, inside of them. And besides colors, what they also introduced to the plants is disease resistance. Because if, if you've ever grown anthuriums, you know that they're very susceptible to anthracnose and other fungal wilts, right? Apples. If you go shopping anywhere in the supermarket, hopefully you'll appreciate the, the variety of fruit out there. And that's because somebody has bred a different, different varieties. Um, People tell you that the best tasting apples are not the ones we import in the Trinidad because those are shipping apples. They're bred for durability and low, um, low senescence, so they, don't, they take a long time to rot them. <laughs> so they're good for shipping, but they're not the best eating apples or best for juicing or pies. I don't, have you ever seen purple carrots? Not yet. On, hasn't hit our market yet, but they make fantastic coleslaw. Imagine that coleslaw. Mm -mm. But as a, as a result of plant breeding, to get different colors into what we consider standard. I know some of us have a, a notion that tomatoes must be red, eggplants must be purple. But if you ask a plant breeder, he says, no. I used to grow white melangin, yellow tomatoes. I've seen yellow watermelon, which are sweeter than the red watermelons. But because of people's ex expectations, they will not touch a yellow watermelon. <laughs> because they, they assume that all watermelons must be red. But plant breeders go beyond that, and, they have, and so there's a lot of variety in, in what they create. And because it takes a long time to, to breed any plant, I can, for example, our cocoa breeding program for Trinidad cocoa is 60 years old. So it represents six decades worth of work. And so the, 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 the concern was that um, if, some, if the Brazilians got their hands on the new varieties, that would be very bad. That, that means you've stolen 60 years worth of research that you can't just get back. Because the thing with plants is, once you have one pod, you have, you have the entire thing. It was because it's self-replicating. Right, even less familiar. Geographical indications. These are goods that come from a specific region where the quality of the goods or the unique characteristics are said to be derived from the region. So I think many of us, if you're into teas, you might be familiar with Darjeeling tea. Some of us might be familiar with just plain old Lipton, which is black tea. But the, uh, for the tea connoisseurs out there, Darjeeling represents a different flavor because they, it comes from a special region, region in India. And they certify the quality that it must be this. Uh, similarly, uh, champagne is technically sparkling white wine. But you can't call your sparkling white wine champagne unless you use the champagne grapes 
and produce them in the Champagne region in France. And then there's something called Process Champagnois to get sparkling white wine. You can get sparkling white wine from California, Chile, Australia, but you can't call it Champagne unless it comes from Champagne region in France. And that applies to the cheeses, Parmesan, Roquefort, and a whole bunch of liqueurs, Chianti, you know, Chardonnay. Uh, if you're into whiskeys, you know the difference, hopefully, between a Scotch whiskey and a Tennessee whiskey. The same grains, but because the ones in Scotland use the PT water, which looks like mud, but it's acidic, it's bog water, to produce their, Scotland, their Scotch whiskey, their whiskey, sorry, it tastes different from Tennessee whiskey, which is also filtered through maple chips, if you know the process with um, Jack Daniels, no? Okay. Uh, but it, it, if you're a Scotchist, you can taste the difference. If you're a rumist, you can taste the difference. If you're a coffeeist, you can taste the differences. Those who know the difference between a Colombian and a Jamaica Blue Mountain and a Hong Wing, there are differences you can taste. And what you're saying is that these differences, if they're applied for as a geographic indication, it allows you to add value to the costing, to, to the, your, your selling price. I put the um, Trinidad Cocoa, even though it's not yet registered as a, 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 a geographical indication. We've been pro trying to provoke the authorities to please file it because other com countries and other companies are using our cocoa to manufacture their own um, uh, domain cho chocolates. So if you're a chocolatist like me, you know that there's a French company called Valrona that manufactures a chocolate called Grand Couver, where all of the cocoa comes from the Grand Couver region in Trinidad exclusively. It retails for about nine euro for one bar. Of course, those of us who just eat Charles candy could are horrified. What? So, so much? If you're into proper dark chocolate, and you know the difference between dark chocolate from, say, Africa, which is just bitter, and our dark chocolate, which has a very round flavor and fruity notes, I'm a chocolatist. You can taste the difference between our, cocoa, our chocolate and a St. Lucian chocolate, an African cocoa, Belgian chocolate, even though the Belgians get it from Ghana. But there's a tasteable difference that people pay for. That's, that's the point. People pay for these differences, which is why it's worth acquiring these rights to extract more value from your production. That's the bottom line, more value from what you're doing. Right, trademarks. We know them as brands and logos, but simply a sign or symbol to distinguish your goods from the goods of your competition. And I think this is where perhaps many service industries would be focused. What do you call yourself or what do you plan to call yourself? And you should be aware of what are the rules concerning getting a registered trademark. And make a distinction because if you don't register your trademark, what you have is an unregistered trademark. <laughs> and you might see people using the, the terminology uh, next to their, their mark TM, which we understand to be just a trademark. But if you see a, an R within a circle, that's supposed to be a registered trademark. So there's a difference in, in the presumptions of ownership and whether or not it is a real trademark or not. We'll explain. So, I mean, we have, if you look at it, if you shop in any, any, anywhere, you know that there are tons and tons of brands that distinguish themselves from the competition. And so some of these stand out, or we, rec we recognize them without even the words. So we know who that is, without even any language. Ever since I was small, they've been using this script. They have not changed. That has been their brand for decades. So, if you plan to get one registered and get it passed or very astute <laughs> trademark examiners, uh, we say your, your brand must be distinctive, meaning not generic. You can't bring a box and expect, well, that's my mark. And not, disc and not descriptive. If you're selling computers, your, the first line in your, your brand can't be PC or computer in the brand. That's why the guys who sell computers, what do, what do they call themselves? Well, Dell. We know it's Michael Dell's name. It's, it's not a unique name. Compaq, a made-up name, for example. That's an older brand. IBM. You realize that there's nothing to do with the PC itself. And so these are some, well, more familiar brands. Made-up words. This is an invented word. Apples have nothing to do with PCs. 
And of course, we know what the, the Nike swoosh is. They even have a name for it, SW and three O's SH as a registered trademark. And of course, the famous Coca-Cola, which has protected the word, not just Coke, they, they protect the shortened form, they protected Coca-Cola in the script, and I think, uh, right, yeah. Uh, I was gonna show you another slide just now. But distinctiveness, I, I put this, this slide in here just to show you that uh, manufacturers go to some lengths to dis distinguish themselves in the competition to make sure I don't look like every other cookie cutter who's in my business. I must be distinct. My brand must mean something, must convey something about my qualities and my reputation. People must tremble when they see my brand or something like that, <laughs> you know? It must convey something, something positive. So everybody tries to think, especially when they're in the same market, they will make sure that they contrast themselves. I bet if we have another phone company that jumps into the CT market, they're gonna use some other color, like blue or whatever, just to stay away from that color scheme. Pepsi has always been on a, on a blue theme, even though they have the three colors in, in their brand, because Coca-Cola has been always red. And th these guys like what have maintained their brands and well, sporting, sporting goods are also a, a very tight area. I, mean, I was about to talk about Coca-Cola, because Coca-Cola, besides Coca-Cola and Coke, they also register the shape of the bottle as a trademark. It's that famous, so when people t t say you have a Coca-Cola shape, you have a trademark shape. <laughs> And the story behind it is that what they were trying to emulate was actually a cocoa pod. So the original cocoa bottles had a narrow base, but it was too unstable. They would tip over too, too easily, so they had to broaden the base, make it a little fatter. So it doesn't look, but they, what they retained was the grooves, like a cocoa pod in the side of the bottle. So whether it's a silhouette or a full bottle, that shape is registered to Coca-Cola. And these are the shapes don't even name, need a brand, a name. So we know that's the Gerber baby. Well, we said Nike already. Uh, if you're considering going abroad, you need to consider what other forms of protection might be available to my marks when I go to another country. I mean, we can tell you all about what's the condition, trading conditions in Trinidad, what we would register. But some other countries would register other things about your mark if you have them available. So in some other countries, they register sound. And I'd, you probably know this one. Anytime a, an MGM movie starts up, you hear the roar. And that roar is trademarked. It belongs to MGM. You can have, I think there was a company, I remember, trying to remember which one, but they had a, the joke was they had a cat that would meow at the end of it. It's, it's a mockery of this one. And you, as I was talking about um, uh, going abroad, you need to be sensitive to translations of your, your, your brand. Consider that we are right next door to a Spanish-speaking market, and you could consider ending up in, in South America, Central America at some point. Ask yourself, how does my brand translate into Spanish? Is it going to be anything insulting, negative, derogatory, or just bad for business? Um, some of us may know this example. Anybody? Has one, knows what this is? Tata. Right. Do we know what Tata means in Trinidad? <laughs> which which kind of explains why that brand of trucks and vans did not sell, in my opinion, very well in Trinidad. They tried it one year and could not, somebody should have advised them, don't change the brand, don't, don't call it Tata in Trinidad because nobody wants to be seen driving a Tata <laughs> in Trinidad. And, and you have to be, that's what I'm saying, you have to be culturally sensitive because only trainees get that joke. When, when we tell other people, and you see one person not laughing, and he's, like, he's looking around, what's he? And then you have to ask him, so where are you from, sir? And then he's, there, he's not from Trinidad. It's not his, it's not his parlance. Uh, there was an Indian guy who actually pursued me all the way to the car park after I presented something once and asked me, why don't you like Tata? <laughs> because he, was, he used to be a Tata engineer. And we're not saying that Tata's a bad company, no. It's a massive company. It's Ratan Tata, the owner, is a multi-billionaire. Tata Engineering owns Jaguar and Range Rover. It's not a small company. You know. It's a big company. It's got reputable engineering. It's just that we don't like the name. <laughs> That's all. That's all. 
So I had to explain that we have nothing against Saturn. It just said, sounds funny in Trinidad. <laughs> Mitsubishi made a similar blunder with, well, at least in Trinidad, we can get away with driving up a hero. If you know Spanish, or you're from South America, and you use South American slang, you won't want anybody to call you up a hero. So you can understand when you pull up in the airport to pick up your South American colleagues in your Pajero and wonder why are they laughing at your car? Because <laughs> you're driving a Pajero, <laughs> right? So in South America, you have to, they had to mon, uh, market the Pajero as the Montero. All right? Because you can't sell a Pajero in South America. Language, that's all. No, I'm not going to tell you now. Ask me afterwards. <laughs> um, there's a... A French company that makes uh, cream cheese, Kiri. In fact, you may have seen, um, I think they make the Happy Cow brand, the small cream cheeses in, that are small wrap, wrapped in wax that they got them priced one of the markets, supermarkets. Right, fine, it's Kiri, not offensive in English or French. When they considered exporting to Iran, they had to change the name to Kibi because Kiri in, in, in Parsi, in Iran, means... Um, Male genitalia, right? Or something rotten or rancid. That, 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 that is, that's in Iran. You, so that just emphasizes you must do your homework. In fact, the ideal thing is before you hatch your company, because the, the tendency is you're hatching a company and you're going to name it after you or you and your partner. All right. Or um, if you're into, the, into products, or some services, they name it after the service that they're doing. So you're in the courier business, something couriers. It's on the button. And here's something that you need to be aware of or tell your marketing people. Marketing instincts are counterintuitive to what is required for successful trademark registration. Trademark registration requires that your brand not be uh, descriptive of what you're doing and not be laudatory, meaning that you avoid the words like best, excellent, Words that are alluding to quality then, or good. <laughs> I mean, the temptation is to put, is to put that in top-level consultants. Yeah. Areas that you get into load, some laudatory terms there, uh, that, that, uh, which would cause a problem for getting your, your, your brand registered or your, 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 your company registered. Not your company. It has no, this is the difference. Just to emphasize, this is not company registration at the company's registry. This is registration of your trademark, your brand, at the intellectual property office. Big distinction and very different sets of rules. Okay? Because you may have said, I had no trouble getting my company registered at the company registry because they don't apply the same set of rules. Because you have to understand what the IP office is giving you when it gives you a trademark is a monopoly on that word in a particular class of goods and services. And you need to consider too what, what services you, you or, or other goods that you apply for because you may just be looking at, say, services, but you may be engaged in some kind of merchandising. So you may ask for the, the, the brand to be registered, let's say, for clothing because you're putting out merchandise caps and jerseys and for paper products because it's going on your letterheads and what other livery that you may be using your, your brand on. And some they consider the, the, these, these bigger companies, that's how they make their money, just to put the football teams in particular. To put the bank's brand on a football jersey, the banks have to pay. Okay? Uh, so when you see, watch, anytime you watch any of those big matches, you realize that the price changes. The top price is for, to get your brand here. You pay less money to get it on the shoulders. <laughs> There's a price. And, and uh, if you've ever seen racing driving uh, or rally driving, and you, you realize these guys have overalls covered in brands and the cap. So there's a pricing. One price for here, one price for the side. Of course, it costs less at the, at the back. And the top prices are for the top half of the, the, the overall. Those things, just to put the brands on it. So it's not just sponsors, you know. These guys pay to put the brand on, 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 the, on the outfits. Something to consider when it, as your business grows and expands. It may not be apparent now if you're just starting out, but you need to consider where you might end up if you do well. Right, trade secrets. This may not apply so much to the service sector, but you may be familiar with them anyway. Right, so we're familiar with the, 
the kernel's secret recipe, right? Coca-Cola's secret formula. Of course, the Angostura secret formula. And this one you don't know a bit. That's um, KC Confectionery, KC Candy manufactures a sweet called mango chili. And in my opinion, it tastes like a half-ripe Julie mango chow. If you know anything about that, then you know that's a, that's a flavor unique to Trinidad and Tobago. To describe, it's hard to describe to a foreigner. What is a Julie mango? And what is half-ripe? <laughs> and what is a chow? So it, it tastes like half-ripe Julie mango chow, something, with pep, something peppery. And they told me they, they spent a lot of time concocting that particular flavor. So it's kept on a lock and key now, and, they con and it's controlled. I say control because if, you don't, if you're manufacturing something and you don't take steps to control access to it by your staff, what happens when your staff demit or leave or get fired? Who is it when they get fired? Because now they're vexed with you, right? So you have to ask yourself, are they privy to the core of my business? Trade secrets. And sometimes in even the service sector, your trade secrets or manufacturing, your trade secrets could be manufacturing processes. Uh, that add to your, your, your bottom line, that make life easy for your factory. So you need to consider who is privy to it and have I taken steps to include any kind of non-disclosure confidentiality in, co in employment contracts? Because you have to ask yourself, what is important to my business? Am I, am I safeguarding these assets? These are intangible assets. They are knowledge assets, but the assets are all the same. So instead of just only concerned with... Um, your alarm and your security system for your premises, you need to consider what are my intellectual assets that are, I need to protect as well. Because we, I, I do know of a, a certain large company or medium-sized company in Trinidad and Tobago who claimed, who made a complaint to us that their, their chief chemist had stolen their trade secrets. I say, okay. Uh, who else knows about the trade secret? Well, 300 ex-employees. So, well, you have no trade secret, okay? So they had to abandon that, that um, what they were, plan they were planning to sue, and they couldn't, they couldn't because they, they would have been shut down. Trademarks last essentially 10 years, but they can be renewed indefinitely. So there's a brand, like the Angostura brand has been around for 164 years. Just to mention what Angostura. Angostura could have, back to the trade secrets, Angostura could have gotten a patent on their recipe way back then, but they would have only gotten 14 years protection. And in return, they would have had to expose the entire recipe. So it's a gamble it took. Keep it a trade secret and hope that you guess what it is. And somebody asked me a question yesterday. Suppose I crack the recipe and I publish it out there. I told them, but the first thing, Angostura won't even respond to you. Because if you say, I have the recipe, I'm not going to say, well, you caught me. The game is up. They're not going to say that. They're just going to ignore you. Okay? That's, that's the game. Now back to this trade secret. Patents last up to 20 years and then for invention, they're not renewable. So once your patent expires, that's it. Your technology goes public domain. Anybody can use it without permission. Anybody. Uh, actually, that's the basis of the whole uh, generic pharmaceutical industry. Expired patents or patents that are not enforced in Trinidad and Tobago. That's the, that's the, it underpins the entire CDAP um, project. CDAP could not work unless they had Intel, which they get from us, which drugs they can buy that are off patent, for example. Uh, industrial designs, like I said, last five years, but can be renewed twice for a total of 15 years. Uh, new plant varieties, depending on if it's a, a tree or not a tree, 15 or 18 years. Uh, GI is actually the only one that can last uh, pre under our present law forever and ever. We also recommend to change that. There must be something to limit that. So understand that there's a, there's a landscape here. And also appreciate that any given product, the IP is not mutually exclusive. So um, a product like a, 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 a Viagra can have a patent on the chemical and a trademark on the name Viagra and copyright on the all literature that goes in the box. If you realize you can have multiple IP on, a given, on one thing. Uh, something to consider when you, if you're going abroad. We have some conventions that allow us as trainees to file overseas because we are party to a number of conventions and treaties. So under the Paris Convention for Industrial Property, we can file our patents and trademarks, all our industrial property, in other countries that are party to the Paris Convention. And that's, that's nearly, nearly everybody. 
I think the one of the latest ones to join was Jamaica. They, they joined a few years ago. They're kind of late on board. But un under that, though, you have one year for some things under patents, for example, to file overseas. Six months for industrial designs. So just bear in mind that there's, a, there's some time limits for some of these things to file overseas in another country. For patents, there's the presently something called the Patent Cooperation Treaty, uh, which gives you up to 30 months to file in another country that is also party to the PCT. We are considering, in fact, the legislation, there's a trademark bill, 2014, that once it hopefully gets granted this quarter or by next quarter, the latest, will usher in uh, our accession to the, something called the Madrid system for the international registration of trademarks. That means that with your your, under the present system, you have to shop around your, your brand to each country. If you're doing business in Jamaica, Barbados, you have to go find, a, find an attorney in Barbados, find another attorney in Jamaica, translate. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, and, and, and pay different sets of fees to file over there. Uh, through an attorney, so you're paying an attorney fee plus the administrative fees. Under the, under the Madrid system, you can stay at home, file one application at our office, and designate and say, I want to go to any other country that's party to it. Presently, uh, in, in CARICOM, only um, Antigua and Barbuda are party to the Madrid system. In CARICOM. And we will be joining soon. Uh, that's the plan. To make it easier for... Um, trademark owners to file overseas. And that way you, cut out, you actually cut out the, um, the attorneys because <laughs> you can go straight office to office. That, that's the beauty of it. Uh, like, like, likewise for industrial designs, we are also considering accession to something called the Hague Agreement. And it works the same way. Find one application at home and it goes to a bunch of other countries wherever it's, whoever else is party to it. Presently, in CARICOM, only Belize is party to the Hague Agreement. So that means for all the other markets of interest, let's say Jamaica, Barbados, you still have to go one one individually within the time limits allowed. Something to consider, because you need to consider where am I going, where is my business going, and in particular, it's a special importance to the service sector, especially the service industries that are, are let's say, net-based. That means you're not fettered by plant and building, and you can offer your services far and wide, abroad, if I need to do that. And well, I think we, you're probably clear on, on, on the purpose of why do we run down all these things in IP. They give the owners a measure of control over their intellectual creations, and the idea is it's to facilitate your use of them uh, to gain your economic rights, it's, it's to make money, bottom line. And to also um, control the dissemination of your, of your, your goods or your, your IP. Uh, right, make money. I hope everybody, that's everybody's plan here, right? To make money, right? Unless you <laughs> Just to show you what we mean by money. This is just a list of brand values measured last year. Brand values only, not, this is not the value of the company, the value of that little apple, that little, that little thing has a value, that little trademark. And Apple leapfrogged to the top of the list last year, 98 billion, that's US dollars, brand alone. Previously, Apple and Google actually leapfrogged over Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was, was on top for, for about 11 years in the 73, 77 billion dollar range. And then these two technology companies just jumped they came out of nowhere <laughs> into the top 10 and then up to, up to number one and two spots, respectively. You notice the profile here. Technology, technology, beverage. Technology, technology, hardware, technology. Food, experience, tech, tech, transportation. It's, it's, you should um, just make your own enlightenment. The source is here. Just Google best global brands by interbrand, and you'll get the, the post, the, the top 100 brands, and you'll be amazed at who is more valuable than who, because it may change some of your perceptions, because you may have a perception of one brand, not realizing that, you know, Toyota is right now worth more than Mercedes-Benz, just to give you a, a heads up, brand value. 
uh, there are some companies like say Nestle that have sub brands. So there's a parent brand Nestle and sub brands like uh, Nescafe, Nesquik, and companies like that. Some of these sub brands are worth more than the parent brand in some cases. Some some they consider that in your business venture you may have more than one endeavor, more than one venture, and you may consider having as companies get bigger they have satellite companies, associates, that also have brands attached to them. You, know, you need to consider, at some point, these companies or entities will become ent some, some discrete entities of themselves where, because of the reputation of the firm, the brand becomes valuable. That's something to consider if you're considering mergers and acquisitions or selling your company. Do not just sell the premises. You should, con you should cost the brand of your company separately because among your clientele, your clientele may not be, even be aware that you sold the company to a Chinese firm. <laughs> Let's say it's, it's, it's an IT firm or it goes to India. All they know that they're, they're receiving a service online and they don't really care where it is. What they care about is what it's called because they trust your brand. That, that is just to put the focus back on the company. The, company is not, the brand is not just a tag you stick on your jersey and on your hat and a, a shingle on your door. It conveys uh, the reputation of your firm to your clientele, which is what they trust. It's the same way you shop. We shop by brands that we trust. We, if we are faced with a, a big choice, we go for, well, I know, right. I can't find my drink. Give me a Coke. You have your default brands. You have your favorite brands. They're things that you do without thinking. But that, that's what the market is called top of mind. as based on reputation and trust over the years. Right. I don't, if you've studied business, you may have read some of Peter Drucker's stuff, late business guru. And he said some very interesting things about um, purpose of business. So our purpose is to create a customer. And the business enterprise has just, in his opinion, only two basic functions, marketing and innovation. That's all. He said those two things, he said create results, but they actually create wealth. Everything else your business, think about it, everything else your business does cuts costs. You think, think about it long enough. How do you create wealth in your firm? You have to come up with something new. How do you let your clientele know that you have something new? You have to market. And that, that actually speaks to now two major aspects of IP, which is, let's say, if you're into patterns and de designs, and then for marketing, your trademarks, your branding. So you realize what underpins what. And that, that actually underpins where your business, what your business should be concerned with anyway. Not just image, but also delivery on the image and in innovating within your, your industry. And we've done some analysis of the value of companies. These are publicly traded companies where you can get the, the share value of the company. Uh, so you know what, what all of their assets are worth. In the past, companies the, most of the value used to be in, its, in their tangible assets, what we call plant, brick and mortar assets. If the accounting types here, they know where the brick and mortar assets are. Cash and bank, building, etc. And the intangible assets, uh, we used to be, I know a lot of our accountants used to write them off as goodwill, <laughs> right? And that's based on the market valuation. But now with present market valuations, you realize that the brick and mortar assets account for a fraction, less than 20% of your market value. So where, where does all this intangible value come from? It can't be all goodwill. Most of it is actually in, uh, predicated on your, in, your intangible assets as intellectual property. Not just your patents, your trademarks, but also things like your customer lists. Uh, do you have any superstars on board? You, any gurus as far as consultants in your, in your firm? Are you the guru or you have a guru? Uh, do you have a Steve Jobs, you know, a shining light somewhere in your, in your company that, 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 that makes the, the, the company gravitate towards your, your company, or buyers gravitate towards you? Those are the things that are factored into your intangible assets. So it's not just, you realize that your brick and mortar assets are the, the least of your, your concerns. Unfortunately, the banking sector does not yet recognize the value of our banking sector, <laughs> of this. So you will not be able to get a loan yet in Trinidad based on your intangible assets. Now this is where we'd like to see our financial sector moving, where we regard intangible assets as collateral. 
um, because in foreign markets, this is what, this is where this is where they are. You can actually borrow against your copyrights and your trademarks and your patents. Uh, I'm gonna give you some examples, though. and I'm not gonna get into that. There are different ways to do it, right? Obviously, this information is very hard to come by. Eh? People don't tell you how much they borrowed and what they use as collateral. But just for you, for you to know, once upon a time, in, at least in Disney wants leverage its, its considerable copyright, some of it, in order to secure a loan of $400 million. So the bank was willing to take as collateral ownership of Disney's repertoire, or part of its repertoire of movies, which, is a, it, which has grown even more extensive now. Uh, let's see. Calvin Klein. This is significant because what does Calvin Klein own? They're not, they're not the technology. They own trademarks. What are their trademarks? Calvin Klein and CK. So they leverage, they actually put up as collateral their brands, CK and Calvin Klein, to secure a loan of 58 million at the time. You think um, you can talk to your bank? <laughs> ah, ah, I told so. <laughs> well, actually, I like to say it's when because just to let you know, uh, we do have a committee right now working, and I have members of the Banking Association on, and we're trying to get inside their heads literally. So <laughs> why can't you all put up these things as collateral yet? And uh, we're getting their feedback, and we're trying to encourage them to get some advice from their principals, especially the, the Canadian-based banks, because their, part, their principals and even the, 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 um, the financial uh, consultants, the, the price warehouses and, and so on, to ask their principals away, what are the methodologies used by your principles to put a value to intangible assets because we know it can be done. If you're into accounting, you must know of the international accounting standards number 34, which you have to account for intangible assets. And some local accountants, I mean, they do have to do it. When they're doing mergers and acquisitions, they have to put a number on your brand, on your logo, not just your fixed assets. And so quite rightly, some of the owners were saying, if I have to pay to get this done and there's a number next to it, as far as the value, why can't I borrow against it? It's an asset. Okay, but that's another fight. Uh, Nestle, look at that. Put up its brands. This last one might surprise some people. David Bowie. Uh, now you gotta test your age. How many of us know who David Bowie is? Well, once upon a time, up to, up to, up to 97, huh? it's not his, not his newer stuff. After that point, he sold or signed his, the copyright in his songs up to that point for $58 million, $55 million. The company, an insurance company, took up that, took that bond. They took up, they bought it from him, and they issued a, an instrument based on it. It was known as the Bowie bonds at the time. No, oh, sorry. These are U.S. I should have put a, my apology. That's US, that's, those are U.S. dollars. I must fix that slide. Yeah. And so we, we're saying, if an insurance company could see, could put a number on his, on his, and make money off of it, what is stopping all people from doing it? Yeah, I, I would answer that. <laughs> you, uh, before people say I'm bashing the banks and the. But uh, that's where I wanted to end uh, on the money side, and I, I hope that doesn't inspire you to um, consider what assets may I might I be sitting on? Uh, what assets should I be looking out for going forward? I hope that when we enter into agreements in the future, we will be looking out for IP clauses. And let me tell you, this thing gets, gets very broad. Once you get into contracts, you need to ask, and I've, I've had this discussion with project managers, because most projects are very cut and dried, and very, oft, very seldom, I should say, have they considered what if we solve a problem while going forward? Who is going to own it? This is where it gets very contentious when things get created and the fight starts over ownership, right? And people have this notion in Trinidad that because money changes hands, therefore IP ownership changes hands, and that's not necessarily true. Some of this IP must be transferred in writing. It can't just be transferred because you paid for something. And I know ad agencies had, had, have issues with this. Uh, we've had some, some discussions with them in the past. But please consider um, uh, what you're doing, and there's a value to your intellectual efforts. It's good to find out now before you, um, in fact, the ideal thing before you named your company would, be, would have been to have been aware of trademark laws. <laughs> because now you may be saying, okay, I'm gonna run out of the office, 
And then my colleagues here reject you, <laughs> your application, because sorry, not fitting the criteria. And it, why, I'm, why I'm encouraging you to do this, this, do this thinking before you, you create your company name or your brand, because you, once you're armed with that foreknowledge, you can then shape it or craft it or change it so that it, it meets the requirements of the law so that you have a, a, an enforceable brand. That's, that's what you really want in it. You want an enforceable brand. If you have an unregistered trademark, it's difficult to enforce. It's not impossible, but you have to resort to other tools in the law, like the law of the total passing off, and which could get messy, and un, 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 unfair competition, and those kind of talk. There are some other instruments which are not IP, but they're not as tidy as, as pure IP infringement, which is very, very clean. Okay, so with that, I, I, I suppose there are arrangements now for questions and answers. Thank you very much.